secondly, if you have questions, you'll need to type them into the chat. We're expecting a pretty big crowd today, which means the free-for-all model isn't going to work for us. So if you could please just post them into the uh, question and answer box, which you should see uh, next to you. Uh, we will get to your questions and take them at the end. It is possible we'll be able to unmute people after the webinar. Uh, I'm not sure. We're just going to play it by ear, I think. But probably it'll just be if you type them in the Q&A box, I will... Uh, repeat them to Carol, and she will um, give us her wisdom, or share her wisdom with us, I suppose. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Uh, we have Dr. Carol Engel. She is an aquaculture economist with more than 40 years of research, extension, and teaching experience, and is devoted entirely to the economics and marketing of aquaculture. Uh, Dr. Engel has worked across the world on various economics and marketing topics related to shrimp, prawns, tilapia, carp, uh, pacu, pasu, I don't even know that one, uh, sh shelf, you'd think I would, <laughs> I used to be an ichthyologist, anyway, shellfish, seaweed, trout, catfish, hybrid striped fish, bait fish, and sport fish aquaculture, and for production systems including ponds, raceways, aquaponics, RASs, and various types of both suspended and bottom culture methods for shellfish. Dr. Engel is the immediate past editor-in-chief of Aquaculture Economics and Management and immediate past president of the International Association of Aquaculture, Economics, and Management. Uh, she has also served as past president of the U.S. World Aquaculture Society and is the immediate past executive editor of the Journal of World Aquaculture Society. Uh, very, very prestigious um, speaker that we have today. Uh, her publications include five books, uh, including the 2019 Printing of Aquaculture Businesses, as well as Aquaculture Economics and Financing, and the 2017 Second Edition of the Aquaculture Marketing Handbook. 133 referee journal articles, 19 editorials, 18 magazine columns, 49 book chapters and monographs, 20 proceedings articles, and well over 100 extension fact sheets and popular articles. She's received uh, over 86 different externally funded awards, more than $19 million, and she's been honored with the Distinguished Service Award from the U.S. Aquaculture Society, the McCrarran Award from the National Aquaculture Association three times, and the Researcher Year of the Year from the Catfish Farmers of America, and Distinguished Service Award also from the Catfish Farmers of Arkansas, not once but twice. And so we are very happy and pleased to have her uh, presenting on aquaculture um, today in aquaculture business planning. And so with that, I will turn it over to you, Carol. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart, for that kind introduction. Can you hear me, my audio fine? I can hear you great, thank you. All right. Well, thank you to everybody today and welcome to those who are attending. And thank you to the Great Lakes Aquaculture Collaborative for hosting this webinar here today. excitement about aquaculture these days, and I think for a lot of good reasons. Just look at this picture of the catfish industry and how the leading segment of U.S. aquaculture, after having gone through some very difficult years some time ago, has now reinvented itself with productivity enhancing technologies. What you see in this picture are the split ponds that have been adopted widely now in the U.S. catfish industry in which the pond is split into two halves where the aerators are is where the fish are. And the other side is a water a waste treatment system and the water recirculates through. So allowed them to triple yields and to be able to reduce their, their costs of production as a, as a result of that. We've seen a lot of growth in shrimp, and shrimp farming and interest in shrimp farming in the United States. That's very exciting. We know that still a lot of it, the majority of the, the volume is coming out of pond production, but we've seen a lot of increased numbers of indoor RAS production of shrimp in the United States. That's fun and, and exciting. It's a lot of excitement about offshore mariculture. Some of this has been spurred by the executive order that was signed by President Trump this past May. And so this is an exciting new development. This executive order, though, is exciting for other reasons as well. It deals with some very important issues that affect all of U.S. aquaculture beyond just the mariculture provisions, but it also addresses revising and, revising and revisiting the National Aquaculture Development Plan, revisiting the National Aquatic Animal Health Plan that has repercussions and will affect many segments of U.S. aquaculture. But it also addresses the, the many regulatory issues that have affected U.S. aquaculture, looking at redundancy and looking at duplication of regulations and those that are no longer necessary and have become outdated. So it's a very exciting time for U.S. aquaculture. 
And of course, we have to talk about the ongoing new announcements of investments of large scale RAS production of a number of species, mostly mostly salmon, but of a number of different of different species. It's really been a privilege for me to have had the opportunity to know and work with many individuals who have built and sustained and innovated aquaculture businesses throughout the United States. Their stories are tremendous and their lessons in from the catfish industry and the trout industry for all those who are starting up new businesses about how to overcome the many challenges that they faced that new aquaculture businesses still face today. So across US aquaculture, it's been a real, a real privilege. There is a but to this talk though. And even if we look at salmon wrasse and production, you look at what this might mean. We're talking about numbers that might double the supply of salmon coming into the US market if all of these announced businesses succeed. I'm going to be talking about reality checks as we go through this talk here today. That's the but part that was in the title of, of this seminar. As excited as I am about aquaculture and, and even though I know many, many successful aquaculture businesses in the United States, the very worst part of my career has been when I've been asked to help aquaculture producers who are in serious financial trouble to help them try to get through bankruptcy without losing the family farm, their home, the land that has been in their family for generations, or maybe even worse yet, someone who has lost their entire retirement savings in a failed aquaculture venture. These aren't pleasant things to talk about, but the reality is that most new businesses fail in the United States and the failure rate of aquaculture businesses tends to be a little bit higher than it is for other businesses. We have some of the newer forms of aquaculture that are higher risk. Things like RAS and things like aquaponics. The failure rate of RAS has been quite high in the United States when we look back over the last several years. The turnover of aquaponics startups is very high. Many of those individuals choose to move in exclusively into hydroponics and do not stay with the fish portion of it. So my purpose today is to talk through how to approach an aquaculture business to try to reduce those risks of failure, drawing upon what I've learned from, from working with and, and, and talking with and especially listening to those people who have made tremendous successes of their businesses who are managing third and fourth generation aquaculture businesses that have withstood the test of time from the profitability standpoint and, and have been and are successful. So where do, where do you start? In this talk, I'm going, to, I'm going to be talking more about starting a business, but when I go through the various slides and the various portions of this talk, much of what I'm going to talk about is also relevant to existing businesses because it's important for existing businesses to also reassess and reevaluate their business periodically keep a close eye on these same sorts of things that I'm going to be talking about here. Well, if you're thinking about starting a, an aquaculture business, that's step one is to have that idea of whether you want to raise shrimp or trout or fish indoors or outdoors or shellfish, that's step one. What's step two? Well, then it's to start building facilities, right? It's to build that greenhouse and buy the tanks and start to order your post larvae and order your fingerlings and uh, no, that's not step two. That's a common mistake. I don't know how many times I've heard stories from individuals who say their neighbor spent thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 setting up an aquaponics system. And guess what? Six months later, all those tanks were out on the road and they were trying to sell them. Really what step two needs to be is for you to go out and find your next best friends in, in the form of the aquaculture support network that is available, but you need to go find them and sit down and spend a lot of time talking with them. I'm talking about Cooperative Extension Service Aquaculture Specialists, Sea Grant Aquaculture Specialists, and then also the regional aquaculture centers that are available throughout the United States. And don't forget to find out who, what, and where are your local aquaculture associations. 
Those are groups of farmers that have tremendous experience. Don't think because someone is, is raising trout in a raceway that they do not have things that you can learn from for an indoor shrimp production facility. These individuals that have withstood the test of time have gone through the source and overcome the sorts of challenges that everyone starting a new aquaculture business will face sooner or later. These resources are available and it's very, very important for you to reach out first, read everything you can, ask all the questions you can, try to visit existing aquaculture businesses and ask them what challenges they've had to overcome and, and how they've managed to survive and adapt throughout the years. If they're still in business, they have many, many secrets to success that they're often happy to share with individuals. But that really needs to be step two. When we talk about a profitable business and what it takes to have a profitable business, what it really comes down to is, is the fact that any profitable business is the sum of literally hundreds of decisions that have to be made. Someone I have a great deal of respect for that manages a, a, a substantial aquaculture business that's been profitable for many years once said that it all comes down to these hundreds of decisions and everyone has to be the correct one. That's a very high bar, but that is a statement from somebody who has been through this and started and, and maintained and managed a successful business. It's not just what production system you choose. It's not just what market you're trying to target. It's not just the scope and scale of the business or the staffing pattern or the various management decisions. The financial statements will tell you whether you're successful or not, whether you're profitable or not. But the real key to all of this is that these all have to fit together. There were many years early in my career when I really was searching for the one answer to profitability in an aquaculture business. At some point, I sort of wised up and realized that there is no one simple answer. There's no one system that's more profitable than all others. There's no one species. It really comes down to the individual putting this together and how effective they are at putting all of these pieces together in a way that's effective and meets consumer demands and, and is profitable. And so there is no one simple answer. If you want to start an aquaculture business, or if you're already in business and haven't done so, you need to put this business on paper. You need to develop a plan and sort through and figure out and analyze whether these pieces as you're perceiving and thinking of these different pieces, how they're going to fit together. And when you get to the financial plan part of this, whether or not it is going to be profitable. Most people, when they do their first business plan, it's very, very common for those financial statements to show that it just does not work. The key to this is then to go back and rework the plan and figure out why it's not working, where the problems are, and redo the plan. After two, three, four, five iterations, hopefully you'll be able to come up with something that in fact will work. Now you saw some, some dollars flying into that business plan. You can go hire someone to do a business plan. You can go online and, and there are people that are, are, are happy to take a couple hundred dollars from you and they'll send you a business plan. You can pay tens of thousands of dollars and have a business plan done for you. But you know, at the end of the day, if somebody else does your business plan, who is it that knows the most about your business? In reality, you're the one who needs to think through your business and know more about it than anybody else. I don't do business plans for other people. I'll advise them and I'll give them ideas, but I will not write a business plan for someone else because it's not going to help them if I know more about their business than they do. And so, it is vital for individuals to spend the time doing this themselves. This is not what people enjoy doing. People who want to get into aquaculture often do so because they love to feed fish or shrimp and are not so keen on doing the paperwork, but there's no way around this. It's important to do this on paper. I can guarantee you that if it does not work on paper, it's not gonna work in the real world. So that's the starting point. As a framework for, for this webinar here today, 
I'm going to talk about one particular business planning tool that's available for use. You have to do the thinking behind it. You have to do the work of putting it together. But what this online tool does is outline and provide the guidance for what needs to be included in the plan, what questions need to be answered. It provides a lot of resources to work through all of that. But then it also compiles the whole plan. You do it online and the tool itself takes the pain out of putting together a polished plan at the end by formatting it and adding attachments and things like that. So at the end of this process, you can print out and save a very polished looking business plan that's ready to take to a lender. A lender. This tool is called Ag Plan. It's free. This is not a case of what that of, of you getting what you pay for. In this case, you get far more. It's a website developed by farm management specialist at the University of Minnesota. I've used this online planning tool with, at this point, probably several hundred aquaculture producers over the years, even individuals who were not at all comfortable working on a computer. Once I got them started and convinced them to write down the password for, for logging in, they were able to use this very, very effectively and, and easily. I know other people that use this as well, and I highly recommend using this tool because it's easy to use and it's user friendly. First of all, I just like to share with you the overall structure of this, and then I'm going to go through and highlight a couple of components of the business plan that that we're going to talk about because they they tend to be things that are overlooked and often often end up resulting in mistakes and errors and problems in businesses later on. But first of all, the framework of, of Ag Plan. What you see on the left of your screen is the outline of the business plan. A good business plan needs to address every part of this from the cover page and executive summary, describe the business, describe how the products are going to be produced in the operations section, there needs to be a marketing plan. There needs to be a plan for how to manage and, and organize and staff the business. And then, of course, there needs to be a financial plan with detailed financial statements. Each one of these headings and subheadings that you see on the left is actually a link to a different page. And so when you click on one of those, this box on the top that right now is for the cover page, if you look on the left, the cover page is in bright blue, so that helps to remind you what page you're working on. The box at the top is where you, you put in the information for your business. You can type in the name of the farm. You can upload a photo to this to make a very nice looking cover page. This box at the bottom has lots of interesting things. The tab that says tips are the instructions for what to put in the box above. People who have never done a business plan don't know what to put in the box and don't know what to address. In this case, this is in under the operations heading, specifically products, and it gives instructions for what to describe in that box. The tab that many farmers that I've worked with have found most useful of all is this tab that is called samples. It provides an example of what needs to be written above. I've had a number of farmers say, well, how much do I have to write in each of these boxes? Well, in some cases, a lot should be written. In other cases, not so much. And these examples really give an idea for somebody. In this case, three sentences is enough to describe the overall farm and to provide some background. So the, the sample tab is something that farmers have found very, very useful. In, in terms of the structure then, I said you can attach different files. So you can have financial statements that are either done in Excel or developed by an accountant that can be attached to this. You can attach photos, aerial maps, schematic drawings and things like this and attach them to this. And then under the view print tab, you can choose to generate the plan at any stage of preparation and you can choose whether you want it presented as a Word file or a PDF file as well. So again, it takes that pain out of putting these things, these things together and, and polishing them up. But the thought and the ideas and the questions 
have to be and the decisions have to be made by the person who's going to run the business. So with that broad overview of the framework for Ag Plan, let's talk about a couple of a couple of items. We don't have time to go through all of this. It would take a full day workshop at the minimum to go through every single section of this. But let's start at the beginning and talk about a few key points. I want to talk about setting goals because in my experience, too few people have really thought enough about the goals and why they're starting a business and most importantly, what it is they want to get out of it. If you don't know exactly what you want to get out of the business, it's very difficult to assess whether it's on track and whether it's successful or whether you need to do something differently. So it's very important to be very specific about goals. The goals that are set have to be both personal and business because these are farm businesses with families involved. You need to know what you expect out of it. To one individual, the aquaculture business may simply be a way to continue the lifestyle that they want to continue. They may not have a need or a strong goal for very high income and very intensive but a younger person may have much greater ambitions, may want to grow that business and, and may want to become a leader and may want to really develop it and may have higher income expectations out of the business. How the business is structured gets back to the personal goals. And working with many farmers in developing these kinds of plans for their business and, and analyzing them, it's often very difficult to get people to talk about it. But I remember one gentleman who sat there and he finally said, he said, you know what I really want, Carol? And I said, no. He said, I want to take a vacation. This was an individual who had never had a vacation. He'd been farming fish and farming other crops, had never in his life taken a vacation. And he wanted to go to New Orleans. And I said, well, we need to work that in the plan of who's going to run your farm and operate it while you're gone. And we can do that. But it's important to put the personal goals on paper and structure the business to be able to meet those personal goals. Now, here's a quick quiz for those in the North Central, the North Central region in the United States, and especially those in Indiana. You can put in the chat box if you recognize anybody in that photo, and I'll be disappointed if nobody recognizes at least one individual in that photo. Now, I put this up. Nathan Stone was an extension aquaculture specialist for many years in Arkansas. He's not in the photo, by the way. But he used to talk a lot about a Walmart test that should be used for extension specialists who are working with individuals considering getting into an aquaculture business. He said that we should be asking people if they can make as much money from aquaculture as they can as a greeter at Walmart. Otherwise, if not, they may be better off working at Walmart where they can stay dry and warm and not have to lose sleep at night figuring out how they're going to pay the fee bill that's come due. Even people engaging in aquaculture as a hobby, as a hobby, need to make some money and will want to have some cash coming out of it. So it's very important to think about this and how much income, setting goals of how much input, input and income somebody needs to have. Well, I did see that somebody won that picture. There's an individual who recognized himself in that in that, that picture. And both Matt Smith and Bob Rohde recognized Bob Rohde in that former picture. Good good job, you guys. I recognize so, Bob too, for the record, but I didn't want to. Carmen right. says he recognizes Otis from his uh, University of Arkansas days. That's right. Otis Johnson is there. And I don't know if anybody recognized anybody else, but I'm in that picture too. I've spent my time in the mud and ponds as well. But anyway, good group of people that were working there at that time. So, it's important to set business goals every year as well. And what this means is, what do you want from this business? Are you developing this business as a source of retirement income, as a source of supplemental income? Is this something that you are designing as a full-time occupation to support your family, including putting funds aside for retirement, putting funds aside to put your children through college? It's very important to think about this carefully about what your expectations are. And then it's important to take the next very specific step. How much take home profit do you really want to get out of the, this business? 
Is it 25,000 a year? And this is take home after all expenses, 100,000, half a million. It's very important to, to specify this and specify what your goals really are. Because putting this business together is, takes a lot of pieces, but you need to know where you're headed and, and how you define success and what you want to get out of this. When you put together this plan and start looking at all the, the pieces to it and you get to the end of the financial statements that tell you, tell you what's happening or what's likely to happen in your business, it's important to look at the greatest weakness. For those of you that already have an aquaculture business, you should be doing the same process at least once a year and look at what the greatest weakness is in the business and then, then develop very specific goals to address that weakness and strengthen it. Even if there's no serious financial weakness, then it's important to look at the, the component of the business that is not quite is not performing quite as well as another and set some very specific goals to strengthen the business. The one commonality that I have found over the years for those who have survived in an aquaculture business for decades is that they do make changes, often small changes every year. They go through this kind of analysis and make some changes every year. So it's very important to do that. Is the business struggling with cash flow? Then there needs to be a goal to improve it by 5% or 10%, whatever is needed for that business. Is the financial position weak as, as viewed perhaps by a debt to asset ratio? Then it's important to reduce that and it's important to set a goal to reduce it by 3%, 6%, 10%, whatever is needed in that business to get it back on track and to strengthen in that business. If it's a startup business, are you meeting your goals in terms of gearing up to full capacity? And if not, what are you going to do to meet those goals the next year and set very specific goals to increase production by maybe 3% or 10% or whatever it is to meet your goals and make the financial part of the business work and be successful. So those are a few comments about goals. I, I really find that most people do not think hard enough and are not honest enough with themselves in the beginning about what they really need to get out of it. I wanna make a few comments about the operations part of it. I've skipped over business description. That's very straightforward to work through an ag plan. Under operations, you see this includes everything about the production system, about services, about permitting and regulations about quality control, risk management. We can't spend a lot of time on these things, but I'm going to hit a couple of what I think are, are high points. So if you're starting out, you may, you may be thinking about starting a RAS or aquaponics business. They're very popular. A lot of people are going in and there are lots of advantages and lots of reasons to, to do so. But here's another reality check. If you're thinking of doing this, how much time do you have available to put into this business? When you move fish or shrimp indoors into a tank, this is a much more intensive way to raise these animals. And in, in all honesty, when a problem happens, you don't have very much time to fix it. And you, know you need to know how to fix it quickly, which means you, there has to be somebody available throughout the day and available checking on the system, someone who knows how to fix it and who knows how to fix it quickly. You have to really think about a RAS or an aquaponic system is more like the kind of effort that more like the effort that is required in a dairy, in a dairy. And so you know that dairy farmers are tied to the farm and they have to be there and have to milk the cows several times a day. You have to think of this in terms of labor and time and make sure you're going to have the time of the right kinds of people who can fix these problems. Pond production is not so intensive. You have to pay attention to it clearly. You have to be able to fix problems, but you have a little more time and a little bit greater, longer window to be able to fix the problem before your fish start to die in ponds. So these are things that have to be weighed and considered when you're choosing the production system. My colleagues, Ganesh Kumar at Mississippi State and Jonathan Van Satten of Virginia Tech and I finished some an analysis of a project not too long ago where we compared economics of 58 different aquaculture enterprises and ponds, raceways, and in RAS 
systems. I do want to say at the outset that while we talk a lot about sustainability of these different systems, in reality, we have to recognize that U.S. farm aquaculture production is highly sustainable. The Seafood Watch program has best choices of catfish raised in ponds, trout raised in raceways, bass, shrimp in ponds, and, and wrasse, and sturgeon, tilapia, shellfish. These are all considered highly sustainable. Anybody who wants more data and information, these, these segments are well studied in terms of sustainability, so they are, and we need to all recognize that, I think. When we looked at profitability across these, these, it's really no surprise that many of the pond and raceway systems and enterprises that we looked at are profitable. They've been around a long time, pond, uh, catfish production in ponds, bait fish, sport fish, trout in raceways. They've survived the test of time. The, the owners have worked out efficient ways to operate their business and remain profitable. So that's no surprise. Now there's a red X for RAS and for RAS, we did not have farm data as we did for the other enterprises. We did a modeling exercise of scales of very small up to very large of 10 million pounds a year. And we included full cost. So this includes a return on the investment to investors and found that they were generally not profitable. I do want to say and make very clear that there are profitable RAS businesses in the United States. There's Blue Ridge Aquaculture in Virginia that's been profitable with a RAS business at a large scale for more than 20 years. There are other RAS operations that are smaller scale in the range of hundreds of thousands of pounds that are also profitable. So it's certainly possible to put together profitable RAS systems and I want to be very clear on that but when you look at things generally across the board RAS is more challenging to be profitable and it's important to remember that and consider it there are economies of scale across all aquaculture that's not a surprise but ponds and raceways also have lower risk less risk in terms of production and in terms of financial risk as well so these are important considerations when putting together these businesses to, to think about other things to think about are how to use the, the most important input costs very efficiently. We found in this same study that the established businesses of catfish raised in ponds and trout and raceways are using capital more efficiently than our more extensive systems and more efficiently than RAS. Capital is a major cost in RAS and it's important to find ways to use capital more efficiently. Those RAS farms in the U.S. that are profitable have found ways to do it and emphasize this. Same with labor. Labor is a major cost of production in RAS as well. And you can see that labor efficiency, at least in the modeling exercise that we did, was labor was not used as, efficient, as efficiently as it is in intensive catfish ponds and trout raceways. Just one quick example, a catfish farmer told me that he has no employees any longer on his farm he's raising is one individual, one FTE, a million pounds of catfish a year that he's selling. That's very efficient use of labor and it's important to find ways to use it efficiently and keep costs down. Now your next best friends that you're going to make if you haven't already through all of these resource people that are available to help you through Cooperative Extension and Sea Grant Extension personnel and aquaculture associations will help you talk about and find and look at the research that's available on production efficiencies and how these are related to stocking rates and feed formulations, what these mean for feed conversion rates that are very important because feed is a major cost throughout aquaculture with the exception of shellfish, of course, whether or not to vaccinate or whether vaccines are available. They can also help you talk about and think about quality. While many people think about these production efficiencies, think about what you have to do in terms of quality. The advantage of aquaculture when you enter the market to compete with wild caught supply, the advantage of aquaculture is to produce a consistent supply. Well, consistency also has to do with the size of the product and the taste of the product and the reputation of your company and your product is made with every pound of fish that's sold and every pound of shrimp that's sold. So think in terms of how you're going to manage that quality and put it out there. You have to think about managing inventory. 
if you don't think about it, inventory costs actually can pile up quite a bit and increase your cost of production and think about how you're going to manage this in, in an efficient manner and still meet your marketing goals. In a startup business and in any business that's implementing or making important changes, it's, it's vital to think about the timeline and what has to happen when, how you're going to meet cash flow throughout that, and think about what this is going to mean for finances and how you're going to survive as you're ramping up production or meeting the implementation of any other changes in, in your overall business. The other important part that too few people think about enough is regulations. There are a number of studies that have shown what regulations are costing U.S. aquaculture. Again, I can send you any number of papers on this. It's not the cost of the permit. It's the cost of testing requirements. It's the manpower required to, to, to fill out forms and submit forms and meet with people and do things like that. It's delays in permitting that set your timelines back and result in cash flow problems that result in lost markets and things like that. You can see these numbers estimated for the U.S. trout industry based on a national survey are very, very high. But it's not just trout that faces these regulatory costs. Bait fish, sport fish have very high regulatory costs as well. Shellfish farms also have very high regulatory costs in spite of the fact that we all know how good shellfish production is for the environment in general. Look at the lost opportunities of Pacific Coast shellfish due to regulations. The take home here is that you need to know what they are. You need to know what permits are required and your support, your, your support friends out there through extension, through land grant extension and sea grant extension can help you. Some states are far more difficult in terms of the regulatory framework than other states. So you need to learn what it is in your state the other part of this, if you're looking to get into aquaculture on a smaller scale, these regulatory costs across all the segments that have been studied so far are much, much higher per pound for smaller scale farms. And so this is a real issue that, that needs to be addressed in the United States and is probably making it far more difficult for small scale local farms to subsist and to continue to exist in U.S. aquaculture. It's not impossible. There are many small scale farms that have continued for many years and are doing well, but in some states it's become very, very difficult. So you have to pay attention to regulations. That's one of those categories under operations that people tend to neglect. We have to talk about marketing to some degree. And again, we don't have time to go into a, a great amount of detail, but I'll hit a few high points on, on marketing as well. In the United States, we're in one of the largest seafood markets in the world, but there's another reality check. The reality check is that essentially U.S. seafood consumption per capita is flat in the United States. We just have to recognize it. People get very excited when per capita consumption goes up by 0.1 pound per capita. Don't say much when it goes down by 0.1, but when you really look at it, it's, it's been flat for a long time, and it's well below the world per capita consumption. We are not a big consumer of seafood in the United States, and we have to keep it in mind when we talk about trying to sell aquaculture products and develop markets for new aquaculture production. We are basically a beef, pork, and chicken consuming nation. And you compare these, we have to keep that in mind as you move out into the broader food market to sell your, your product. Another reality check is to not assume that a market for your product exists because you're raising shrimp and we know that people in the United States eat shrimp or because you want to raise trout and you know that people eat trout. You have to keep in mind that people are already buying what they want to eat. The challenge for you and the answer you have to address in your marketing plan is why should they change their buying habits to buy what you want to sell them. Quick it test to them. Shrimp and they're already Quick eating test. shrimp, but they're already eating shrimp where they go to buy shrimp right now. And you're going to need to convince them to buy your shrimp and not what they're doing now. It's very important for all aquaculture producers to face and consider and think about their marketing plan from the perspective of creating a new market for your product. At the end of the day, 
Marketing is a transaction between one seller and one buyer. And it comes down to developing that relationship and building your own customer base for your business. If you approach it that way, you're much likelier to be successful. So I use shrimp as an example here. So right now, a lot of our shrimp is imported coming in. And so you have to think about what you're going to be competing with. What are you going to replace? What are you going to get people to stop buying so they buy your shrimp in this case? Well, imported shrimp tend to be low price. Price is likely to be a factor in the conversation. We don't have high per capita consumption of shrimp, even though we tend to eat more shrimp than other seafood. We're not a big seafood eating nation. Or are you going to try to get people to switch from wild caught shrimp? Well, then you're competing over an even smaller sub, sub segment and price is even likelier to be a factor. Or are you going to try to get people to eat a little less beef or pork and eat your shrimp instead? Now, this is a bigger market as people eat. We eat more red meat and chicken than we do seafood. It's a bigger one, but it's maybe a bigger switch. And how do you convince people to make that change? And where are those people? So at the end of the day, the marketing question that you have to address and the challenge is that you have to find those customers that are willing to pay the price that you need to receive for the quantity you need to produce to be profitable. You've estimated all of that in your business plan and you have to find those customers and then you have to convince them to change what they're doing to buy your product. This is the essence of creating your customer base that's essential to a successful business. We read a lot about RAS and looking at premium prices for RAS products and aquaponics products and maybe other kinds of products and a lot about, well, we're going to, people will pay more for environmentally sustainable product. Well, keep in mind that not everybody is going to pay and not everybody's going to receive an above average price. Some people can. There are some people that will pay more for a sustainable product. There are some people that may pay more for wild versus farmed, but there are some people that'll pay more for farm versus wild. But you have to keep in mind that not everybody's going to do that and not everybody's going to get a premium above average price. When we look long and hard about surveys that talk about what actually drive choices of seafood, we must not lose sight of the fact that taste is number one, and so your product coming out, if you want to get a premium price, it has to be the best tasting, freshest product out there. And every pound of fish or shrimp that leaves your farm has to have that great taste. People are very concerned about safety. They don't want antibiotics. They don't want, they're afraid of heavy metals. Safety and emphasizing that is very important to consumers of seafood. Freshness is very important. Price is always an issue. If you're asking people to pay more for your product, there has to be something that's truly different about it to get them to pay a higher price. If it tastes the same, it's as safe and it's as fresh, they're gonna go with a lower price product. That's the way consumers operate. We are seeing increasingly consumers paying more attention to the source and origin of their product, which is real and real advantage for aquaculture in the US. We're seeing much more attention to local, especially in northern tier states. Not so clear whether that's as true in southern tier states, maybe for oysters and shellfish, and overall quality. So these are the things that really need to be first and foremost in your, in your mind, because this is what people generally are looking for. If you can find some smaller segments that are willing to pay for these other attributes of sustainability and other things, then, then they can be taken advantage of as well. But don't lose sight of these core attributes that are important to all seafood consumers. Make a couple of, a co couple of comments about management and organization. This is, has to do with staffing. Often farmers thinking about aquaculture do think about how they're gonna staff the production part of it, but, but this is a business and the production is only one part of it. Customer service, has to be the heart and soul of any business, especially smaller scale businesses. There has to be a marketing effort in there. This is tougher for smaller scale businesses to find people skilled in all of these different areas, but these are all essential. None of these can be neglected and you have to have the right people doing the marketing, doing the customer service, and you have to have somebody who's paying close attention at all times to the finances 
who can and will step up and say, no, that's just too expensive and we cannot afford that this year. That's vital to have somebody in the business doing that. Smaller scale operations need to have the same people performing several of these functions, but they're all essential. You have to make sure that those folks are there. I'm not gonna spend much time on the financial plan. The financial statements, there's a lot of information about how to do those, and I'll show you some resources in a few minutes at the end of this talk. But obviously the finances have to work. I will say that there are three things that are really vital to financial success. Everyone thinks about profitability, but it's cash flow that brings down more businesses in general, and it's certainly true of aquaculture. A weak financial position, will bring a, an aquaculture business down, as will lack of profitability. The financial statements will, will provide you with important clues as to what is wrong with your business and where the weaknesses are and what kinds of changes are needed to be successful. I will share with you here just some common mistakes in financial planning. We don't have time to go through different financial statements, but I'm gonna start with this. My father-in-law was an eminent forest soil scientist, and, and he talked a lot about scientists assuming a spherical chicken and results from that assumption that made no sense in terms of forest soil ecology. That was his area of expertise. When I thought about this talk, those his, his words just kept coming back to me. And so we have to make sure that when you're putting a business plan together that you're not assuming a spherical chicken as you move forward. One of the most common mistakes that I've seen is to overestimate revenue and cash flow. Research yields are coming out of research studies, and most often the yields that researchers get are going to be higher than what's possible in commercial farms. And if anybody wants to chat about that later on, we, I'd be happy to share that with you. But do not base your projections, your financial projections on yields that are reported by researchers out of research experiments. You need to cut those back and be more conservative. I see many, many initial business plans or, or thoughts or assumptions that underestimate expenses. A lot of published budgets are not based on farm realities. When I look at farm records, all sorts of expenses come in that are legitimate expenses, <clears throat> but not the kinds of things that people at universities tend to think about. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was a university person, so I can talk about university people, but it's important to base your budgets on farm realities. Ask other farmers what different things are costing them, what kinds of unexpected expenses they've had in their business. You'll hear all sorts of things that come up that are not in a lot of budgets that are not based on farm data and farm realities. There are people that try to put in cage operations and assume that the water body is free and the water is free. They assume that the permits are going to be inexpensive and easy to obtain. They assume that they assume that a tractor is available just because they may already own one, but they don't have to charge the expenses to the aquaculture operation. They assume the truck is available at no cost to the aquaculture operation. They assume a building is available at no cost to the, op the operation. I think you can see where this is heading. We're assuming spherical chickens, people who do not plan to replace that tractor or at least the portion of the tractor, the truck or the building that will be used in aquaculture are not likely to, uh, to succeed and survive in the long term because eventually those tractors and trucks have to be replaced. We could spend a lot of time talking about it and our time is almost up here today. So in summary, aquaculture is capital intensive. There are economies of scale. Smaller scale farms can be profitable, but it takes, it takes excellent management to do that. It takes being able to pull together the various components of a business plan in a very, very effective manner. Management is the sum total of all of those decisions that have to be made. And there are a lot of them that have to be made in aquaculture. They have to be the correct ones. And it's important to continue to evaluate and make changes in those decisions as you move forward. Aquaculture entrepreneurs must think in terms of creating markets, even if they're raising something that people are already buying and eating. They really need to think in terms of developing their own supply chains and developing relationships with those in the supply chains. 
you have to build your own customer base. No one's going to do that for you. And you'll have to compete with either wild caught, imported supply, or other farm supply from, from the United States. To be profitable requires strict cost controls and efficiencies. There's no way around that. It's riskier than other kinds of agriculture crops, both in a production and a marketing sense. Producers have to assume that risk for developing the production methods and markets and need to be prepared to do that. There's not much of a safety net for U.S. aquaculture farms. There are a lot of efforts underway to try to improve the safety net, but it essentially does not exist for most aquaculture farms, and regulations are an issue for all aquaculture. And here's one final reality check. So given all of the, the negatives and all of the difficulties and all of the challenges, the final reality check is this. There are people that have put in the time, the talent, the energy, the desire, the passion, the resourcefulness, the resiliency to overcome all of these challenges and to make a living and to make a living across three and four generations from aquaculture. And it certainly can and is a rewarding way to make a living for those willing to put in the effort that it, it does take to be successful. Some resources very quickly, there are free fact sheets from the Southern Regional Aquaculture Center on the different financial statements that are required to help you through that. There is a checklist of farm financial performance and review that is available from Aquaculture Magazine, it was published in 2014. It's also in the Aquaculture Business book that, that has come out this year as a way to look at your business every year and set new goals for the coming year. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention here today. And if there are any questions, then be happy to try to answer the questions that you might have. Great, thank you so much, Carol. Um, let me do my virtual applause for you, of course, if I can find it. Here it is. <laughs> there you go. And we do have a couple of questions um, that have come up. If you have questions, if you could put them in the Q&A box or the chat box. The Q&A box is a little better, but they both work. Um, so the first question uh, that I see is from uh, Titus Seilheimer of uh, Wisconsin Sea Grant. And he asks, how do the regulatory costs for aquaculture compare to other segments of agriculture? You know, poultry, dairy, and so on. That's really an interesting question, and I'd, I wish I had a, a very good answer to it. I've never seen the kind of studies that we've been doing in aquaculture really digging into how these regulations play out on individual farms, gathering very detailed farm data. I haven't seen those kind of analyses in general in, in, in agriculture. The, the one example I'm familiar with is out of California, and it was out of the produce industry where they did look at these things some of the general trends are true. The bigger costs are indirect, you know, the manpower that are spent. The most costly regulations have to do with, with environmental kinds of things. The costs are higher on smaller farms and larger farms. All of those kinds of trends hold true as well. There's a lot of redundancy, a lot of overlap, a lot of duplication that's causing those kinds of, those kinds of increased costs. So all those sorts of things have held up in those studies out of out of California as well. There are some studies of regulatory costs of, out, of, out of Europe, out of the EU on livestock operations, not, not in the US. The ones I've seen are in the EU. And the order of magnitude is, 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 is similar from what we've seen, looking at things like the percent that regulations are of total costs or percent of sales. Uh, they're variable in the United States, state by state. They're, they're highly variable. The business model, they vary with the business model and the scale. But the ones, I, the few that I have seen are, are sort of similar. I know in Virginia, there, there, there are situations here where farmers are having to hire people to handle all of their regulatory kinds of things. And there, there, there are a lot, there's a lot of discussion about that as well. And and I suspect that's why a lot of smaller scale farms in general in the U.S. have struggled to survive, probably. Great. Thank you. And uh, Nicole Wright asked if you could leave the resources slide back on so they can write those down. Or alternately, uh, we can email out those resources to people um, as we get the stuff ready. So if you don't want to share your screen again, we'll, we'll uh, do it from there. 
And then I uh, send a, I'll, I'll send something to you, Stuart, and you great. can just email it out to everybody. We'll do that. That'll be perfect. Then you don't have to write them down, folks. Uh, great. So Claire Thompson asks a couple of questions. One is, are efficiencies with the RAS versus raceways or intensive ponds, uh, did you assess those in terms of length of the growing season? These, they're, they're assessed in terms of the, the two that I showed uh, were capital efficiency and labor efficiency. And, and the way we measured them several, several different ways, but really looking at total pounds of production when the business was at full capacity and full production, looking at, at pounds of production per hour of labor and per dollar of labor. And so it, it is, it's based on the production systems that are currently used. The, for the pond and raceway systems, we had farm level data. We've been doing national surveys of, of different segments of US aquaculture. So it's based on farm level data. And so it's based on the hours of labor and the total pounds per year of production across different models. And so the length, the different lengths of the production season are factored in or embedded in, in those in terms of what is currently being done. And for RAS, it was based on, on several studies that have come out recently in terms of RAS that we modeled from. In general, what you may be getting at, which is true, is that the shorter the time period and the greater the turnover that you have of product. So if you have a, a fish like a tilapia and rest where the, the, it turns over faster and you get it to market sooner, those efficiencies improve and, and they go down a little bit the longer the production season. One of the things that happened in catfish with split ponds, all of a sudden it became feasible to also use hybrid catfish that grow much faster and so they really shortened, dramatically shortened the production, the number of months it takes to get a, a fish to market size. And that has also helped with efficiencies in catfish production. I don't know if that's where you were, what you were thinking of with that question, but it is true that that happens. So a faster growing fish in RAS is going to be slight, somewhat more efficient depending on all the other aspects of the, the RAS system. Thank you. And then one other question from uh, from Claire about the ag planner. Are there worksheets in there that help to plan for variations in production efficiencies? Thinking again about efficiency here. There are no real worksheets within within ag plan. What you do is go through each section and talk about the business and write down the specifics. And then in the financial analysis, financial plan, then you develop for any given set of assumptions. And so when you do a plan, you're, you start off with one assumed stocking rate and one assumed rate of feed conversion and start with that. And what that means in terms of growth and the pounds, the mortality and pounds of product going to market and things like that. And that would feed into your financial analyses in terms of the profit and loss statement and to some degree the balance sheet and, and a cash flow budget as well, you would do that all in those Excel worksheets that would be developed by either one's accountant or you would develop that outside of ag plan and then upload that into the overall system. And so these other resources will help you put those kinds of things together to develop cash flow budgets and pro forma p &L statements and things like that to upload into ag plan. Thank you. Um, Matt Smith uh, at Ohio State, I believe, has a question. So you put up a slide with, uh, you know, sort of summarizing surveys of uh, seafood choice. Um, you know, and what's most important, you had a series of bullet points like taste was listed first, mm -hmm. all the way through local, and then last was overall quality. He just wants to know, were those in order, uh, you know, based on kind of your knowledge, or were they just listed? They are in order. There you go. They are in order. And when you read the, the, the seafood preference literature, you have to read the studies very, very carefully. It, economists, like other scientists, set hypotheses and, and they, they have reasons of things are, they're wanting to look at. And it's very been very popular to look at, you know, do people, are people willing to pay more for what would be a more sustainable product than, than, than another type of product? And, and they look at those, but if you look really hard and kind of make a, a list of all of those, and you look at all of the variables in which were more significant, 
maybe they did prove that in some markets and with some groups of people, they would pay more for a more sustainable product. But when you really look carefully at their regression analyses, taste is still most important. There's no question. Taste is more important than, 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 than everything. And so you can't forget that. And, and so they were in, in order. Safety comes after that where people often avoid seafood they're still afraid of mercury contamination. They're afraid of these things that they may have seen 10 years ago in a newspaper article. So yes, they were in, in order of importance and in terms of trying to look overall at the, at the seafood preference uh, literature. Thank you. And then uh, one final question, and I apologize, we are a couple of moments over the hour. Um, from Alexander, I don't know if it's Primus or Primus from the University of Minnesota. He says, if there were more formal aquaculture-specific training programs in the U.S., that could help support growth of the industry here. So if there were that, what topics do you think would be most important to include in aquaculture-specific training programs? <laughs> well, that, that's, a, that's a big question. I think it would vary quite a bit. What new, new people looking to get into the business need to learn is very different from what existing producers need to learn. And, and it's going to vary by region of the country and it's going to vary. And the, the best thing is to really, really just get out and talk to, to, to people who are looking to get into the business, but talk to existing farmers because most surveys I've seen that have asked farmers what kind of training they want, if they're already in business, what usually comes out at the top is how to deal with regulations and the big issues that they're facing and what's coming down the road and how to contend with that. After that, it's usually research results about how to improve productivity. In some cases, depending on species, it may be marketing issues that, that will come to bear with certain, certain species as they start reaching saturation in their markets. But for other species that are not at saturation, marketing is unlikely to be an issue. Uh, it's, it's an issue for processors and not farmers. And, and so I, I think very effective training needs to be targeted towards different groups. A new producer, in my view, really needs to spend a lot of time working through business planning and financial planning and, and things like that, needs to really learn about marketing because most people don't know how to go out and create a market or think about a market and, and then move on down through the kinds of things that would be involved in a business plan. But I think you have to really tailor workshops to the groups you're working with. A bait fish farmer in Minnesota is the kind of training that would be useful for a bait fish farmer in Minnesota is going to be very different from that needed by somebody in, in an aquaponics business in Wisconsin, for example. A bait fish farmer in Wisconsin probably has very different needs from a bait fish farmer in Minnesota and certainly separate out new incoming people and their needs from from those of existing producers, although bringing existing producers in to talk realities with new people is very, very useful, even if the existing producers are raising trout and raceway and the raceways and the new producers want to raise shrimp and wrasse, there are very important lessons that existing successful producers have for anybody entering a new aquaculture business. Listening to them is worth more than listening to researchers in all honesty. And more important than listening to me as well, I'm in that same category. Great. Well, we really appreciate you uh, sharing your knowledge with us, Dr. Engel, and thank you to all the attendees. We will send out some stuff over email and uh, look forward to our continuing our webinar series. Um, probably December will be the next one. So thank you, everybody.